let's begin lecture 2 of our course uh, today's uh, topics are uh, we'll revisit a few aspects of the c to d versus a to d Again, uh, this is a familiar uh, uh, topic, but I thought I just wanted to mention one more time. Uh, Dirac Delta, everyone has studied it uh, probably in your networks and systems course, but uh, worth uh, revisiting re the properties because that's uh, important. We are going to be going back and forth from the analog domain to the, to the discrete time domain continuous time domain. Uh, sampling our uh, discussion in today's, uh, today's class was uh, going to focus primarily on the, uh, the frequency domain. We already looked at time domain, sampling in time domain is uh, the uniform sampling. And we'll also see how the Nyquist criterion comes from the frequency domain interpretation as well. So that's another uh, uh, part of today's discussion. What if uh, Nyquist criterion is not satisfied. Then we have the problem of aliasing. How do you ensure that aliasing is not present? We use something called the anti-aliasing filter. So uh, why the anti-aliasing filter comes and how multi-rate signal processing helps you uh, uh, work with the anti-aliasing filter. So that's a very key takeaway from today's uh, lecture. And then of course uh, we are always interested in the final outcome. Uh, in the discrete in, in DSP very often our uh, entire processing starts in the discrete domain you do the processing and then you do the output in the discrete time domain you really don't worry about uh, converting it back into an analog signal uh, in our case very often we do want to in some in the application that we are looking at uh, we are interested in the reconstruction process so what is the reconstruction filter? Uh, what is an ideal reconstruction filter? Approximations of ideal reconstruction filter. And then also in the course of uh, today's lecture, uh, a few uh, interesting examples as well. So let's begin. As always, feel free to uh, ask questions. Uh, as I mentioned in the last class, I'll repeat the question because it has to be uh, audible for the recording purposes. So uh, our by and large, when we say that we want to sample a signal, the underlying assumption is that the signal is band limited by its inherent property. Alternatively, I have to make it band limited. So one or the two, either it is band limited or it has to be made band limited, then we apply the Nyquist theorem. Nyquist theorem says that I must be greater than two times the band limiting, uh, the, band, uh, the, uh, the, the bandwidth of the signal. So uh, keep that picture in mind that uh, the band limiting process, so the, the band limited property uh, either has to be inherent or it has to be uh, sort of forced upon it. Here and, or it has to be uh, uh, created via filtering. Okay, that's, that's going to be an uh, important element in what we will discuss today. Okay, so then the uh, next aspect of it uh, is the uh, differences between A to D and uh, C to D uh, uh, system. So this is a C to D, continuous time to discrete time. Uh, this is an A to D. So uh, can you link the A to D to the C to D? What, what is the, the part that takes you from here to here? A, a quantizer. So basically, each of these samples, instead of being represented with infinite precision, uh, do have finite levels. So uh, in other words, you could think of a C to D block followed by a quantizer. That gives you the effectively the A to D operation. Okay, okay. So uh, this is this is the uh, point that you wanted to mention. So uh, keep in mind that uh, here uh, we we do have a uh, discrete. Uh, here we have continuous amplitude in the discrete domain. 
we do not have any loss of information due to quantization. Here it is uh, discrete amplitudes, discrete amplitudes. The minute you have discrete amplitudes, uh, you have lost some information. So that is a, uh, a very important element. So let me just spend a, a few minutes on, on, on this. Uh, uh, again, uh, th this figure is from la the last lecture, uh, uh, highlighting the fact that uh, basically we are talking about uniform sampling throughout this course, uh, the sampling is going to be uniform. Uh, unless we specify, we are talking about a C to D converter, not a quantization part. Uh, Therefore, uh, that is an Im important element. We assume that there's, there's uh, infinite precision. Uh, let me just um, mention one, one aspect that I think is important for us to keep in mind. Okay, so when we have a, uh, a, a quantized signal or a discretized signal, so if the samples are quantized, samples are quantized, then we actually represent it in terms of a, the original signal plus some impairment or noise. So it is the original signal plus quantization noise, quantization noise. It's very important that uh, the reason we keep emphasizing that we are talking about a C to D is that uh, we really don't want to, uh, uh, at this point, focus on quantization noise. Because if you, if you talk about the quantization noise, uh, talk, about the quant talk about the quantization noise, uh, then we can see that there is a signal power, signal power, and there is a quantization noise power. Okay, there's quantization noise power. So the minute you start quantizing, uh, you have to then also keep in mind there is a signal to quantization noise ratio. And uh, the whole subject of A to D is to uh, achieve as high an SQNR as possible. So that's a branch of uh, study that has a uh, uh, important uh, elements by itself. However, multi-rate DSP can play a part in reducing SQNR. So multi-rate DSP, multi-rate DSP can, can uh, reduce SQNR. That part we are interested in. Okay, but uh, but by and large, the since our focus is on the uh, multi-rate aspects, except when we are studying about the uh, enhancement of SQNR uh, using the multi-rate uh, processing, uh, the rest of the time we are uh, more or less uh, looking at it from a, uh, a scenario where quantization noise is not the uh, the main uh, main aspect. Okay, so uh, given that uh, that picture then we can now say that uh, the uh, C to D, that is what we are focusing on, is going to take the continuous time signal, is going to take the continuous time signal, multiply it by a train of impulses as we talked about yesterday. The spacing between these uh, impulses uh, is going to uh, determine how finely I will sample the continuous time signal. So here are some uh, alternate uh, schemes. So this is a scheme where I have a higher sampling rate because my sampling period uh, has been reduced. And of course, if, if I go the other uh, direction, I will get the opposite result, lower sampling rate. Okay, so the, the, this is a, a, the starting point. So let us, let us spend a, a few minutes on the Dirac Delta. Again, this would be something that uh, I believe most of you are familiar with, but uh, it's important for us to highlight the properties and therefore uh, we would like to, uh, so Dirac delta, delta of t is a very unique function. Uh, uh, again, 
each of the branches of uh, uh, study of who use the Dirac Delta have their own uh, perspective on it. Uh, there is a mathematics perspective, there's a physics perspective, there's also the engineering perspective. So I'll give you the en electrical engineering perspective. So I look at, we look at it as a function that is not, dif that basically is equal to zero uh, everywhere other than t equal to zero. Okay, it's equal to zero everywhere, but it is also undefined at t equal to zero. Okay, so it is a function that has to be uh, specified or defined by means of its properties because the definition itself says that there is something undefined about the function at t equal to zero. So the um, the, the, the ways in which we define the uh, Dirac delta are by a series of properties and uh, basically we will use uh, two properties, the sampling property and the area property. So the area property or the, uh, the property number one, if I integrate P to Q delta of tau d tau, that is I integrate the, uh, the Dirac delta where P and Q are on alternate sides of the, of zero, of the origin, okay? So uh, assuming that the, in, uh, the, uh, the period of integration uh, uh, is on either side of where the delta actually occurs, then th this is equal to one. And uh, there, there are uh, several variants of this. Uh, one variant that I'm sure you would have seen is minus infinity to t delta of tau d tau. Basically, it's the same integ integral property. Uh, if I do this, then what we get is actually u of t, the unit step, unit step, okay? So uh, uh, for uh, every uh, t, uh, you will get, it'll, uh, which is t, where t is greater than zero, you will get a unit amplitude and therefore that becomes the unit step. And interestingly, we also uh, note that uh, any scaling of this delta also scales the output. So it, it does have a uh, useful property and that is very important for us because we are sampling a continuous time signal. It has got an infinite uh, levels in terms of amplitude. So uh, the delta function preserves the amplitude of the signal that it is, uh, it, it is sampling. So uh, this is property one. Property two, property two, uh, is the sam so uh, this is the unit area property unit area property the second one is the one that uh, we are actually uh, using that is the sampling property sampling property sometimes also referred to as the sifting property but uh, for us since we are actually talking about sampling. Sampling is the term that we will use, sampling property, okay? So x of t, x of t multiplied by delta of t basically kills, x of t is a, some function, continuous time function, uh, kills the function everywhere except at x of zero. So this is equal to x of zero times delta of t. Okay, so it actually uh, retains the uh, direct delta property, but it is scaled by the function at uh, x, x of zero. And similarly, if you were to apply x of, t, multiply x of t with delta of t minus tau naught, this would sample the function at x of tau naught, again multiplied by delta of t. Okay, the, this is a very, very useful property. Again, uh, this may be very uh, elementary because you've already studied it, but this is important that, because sometimes uh, when you study the sampling property, it is not stated in terms of this, it's actually stated in terms of the sampling property combined with the integral property. So basically the, this and this uh, mean the same thing. You may have seen it that the, uh, the sampling property is defined as minus infinity to infinity, x of tau, del tau, uh, del tau, uh, d, d tau. And this is equal to, what is this? You would have studied this, x of zero. Because 
x of 0 delta of t, if I integrate from minus infinity, the delta of x of 0 is a constant that comes out uh, uh, integral minus infinity infinity of uh, delta of uh, delta of direct delta is equal. So uh, again, you, you may have seen it in this form, but uh, what we are interested in is the uh, the sampling property that the, uh, the, the direct delta preserves. Of course, uh, the variation of this one is also that minus infinity to infinity x of tau delta of tau minus tau naught d tau is equal to x of tau naught. Okay, so basically uh, either way uh, there is a certain uh, uh, property of the direct delta that uh, we need and we are utilizing. Okay, so now we will uh, quickly develop the uh, view of the sampling process. So let me just refresh your mind. Uh, x c of t multiplied by s of t is the sampled signal. So that is the uh, signal that we are going to be working with. The sampled signal x s of t is equal to x c of t multiplied by s of t, where s of t is the periodic uh, train of Dirac deltas summation n equal to minus infinity to infinity delta of t minus n t s where t s is the sampling period and so basically these direct deltas are spaced at that point. Okay. Now uh, would like to get the uh, representation, uh, the, the, the time domain representation is straightforward. So uh, basically uh, what is happening is that the sample signal x of n is x c of n t s, where n is an in, n is a number that is n is equal to zero plus minus one plus minus two. So time domain is 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 very straightforward. So basically, we are sampling the continuous time signal. But the frequency domain is uh, also very insightful. So that is what we are go going to be looking at. So we would like to get the Fourier transform of this signal. Fourier transform. So. Uh, x s of uh, j omega. So uh, basically we want to get the Fourier transform of x c of t multiplied by s of t. It is uh, multiplication in the uh, time domain. So in the frequency domain it is 1 by 2 pi the Fourier transform of x c of j omega that is the spectrum of the continuous time signal which has been assumed to be either band limited to begin with or forced to be band limited via filtering convolution with s of j omega. So uh, the input spectrum this is already given to us, this is already given and this is, the, this is what we want to compute. And again, this is a computation that I am sure you would have done uh, in, in one of the earlier courses, uh, uh, Networks and Systems or uh, one of the other courses, uh, but it is important for us. So just me just make, uh, spend a few minutes just to get the uh, relevant representation. So I want to get the uh, Fourier transform of S of t. So S of t is a signal which which we have already drawn. It is a train of Dirac deltas which are spaced at T s, uh, 2 T s, minus T s and so forth. Okay. And uh, because of its periodic property, it has, it lends itself to a Fourier series representation. So uh, first step would be the computation of the Fourier series coefficient. 1 by T s integral minus T s by 2 to T s by 2 delta of T e power minus j k omega naught T d t, where omega naught is my fundamental frequency that is 2 pi over T s. That is my fundamental frequency and k times uh, omega naught uh, becomes you could uh, maybe uh, it, it actually even is okay to even change it at this point to omega s because this we have already defined to be the sampling frequency. So my fundamental frequency is actually my sampling frequency and uh, so uh, the Fourier series computation and all of the Fourier series coefficients come out to be 1 over T s. 
So, S of t in its Fourier series representation, all the Fourier series coefficients are 1 over T s summation k equal to minus infinity to infinity e power j k omega s into t. Basically, all of them are complex exponentials. All of them have got the same weight. Uh, just recall that the Fourier transform of e power j omega naught t, Fourier transform of this is 2 pi times delta, Dirac delta of, uh, of um, omega minus omega naught, omega minus omega naught. So basically that tells me that the, uh, uh, the S of j omega will be 2 pi by T s, 2 pi coming from the Fourier transform of the uh, complex exponentials, summation k equal to minus infinity to infinity delta of omega minus k omega s, okay. Or in other words, uh, this can also be written as k times 2 pi by T s. So uh, again, the s of j omega also is a series of exponentials. Uh, uh, I am sure th th these are uh, well-known results, okay. So the convolution that uh, we need to have so the property of convolution, if this is my input spectrum x of j omega convolved with a Dirac delta at omega naught, this gives me the following result. It basically uh, shifts the spectrum to the uh, center frequency of the Dirac delta. So if this is omega b minus omega b, then after convolution it becomes omega naught plus omega b omega naught minus omega b, okay, and the center frequency. Okay, so that's the basic uh, convolution property. So uh, expand it. Now to convolve with not a single impulse, but a train of impulses, each of them amplitude of the impulses, 2 pi over T s, okay, or uh, uh, the, um, so these would be at an amplitude of 2 pi over T s. When I do the convolution, I have uh, uh, there is a one over two pi, so the uh, the two pi uh, gets removed. So what I'm left with is a scale factor of one over T s. So uh, one over T s is what is present, and uh, what will happen is each of these will get a copy of the x or, uh, x of j omega. Okay, so uh, this is omega s this is omega b, this point is omega s minus omega b, this point is omega s plus omega b, ex exactly using the basic principles that uh, we have talked about. Okay, so uh, I hope uh, you are clear that uh, the input spectrum, if it had an amplitude of 1, through the process of sampling, would have come that and mathematically the uh, expression is uh, s of j omega this is the sampled signal is a product of the two so basically it is uh, uh, the uh, sorry uh, x s of x s of j omega x s of j omega is equal to 1 over T s summation k equal to minus infinity to infinity x c of j omega minus k omega s. This is after the convolution, all the shifted copies of the spectrum. 
uh, a scale factor of 1 over Ts, which is already uh, visible from the graph. So uh, I would like to just highlight three uh, elements from this uh, expression. These are useful for us in our uh, um, understanding and uh, comfort level with the whole sampling process. First of all, uh, keep in mind that there is a scale factor. Should not ignore it, should not omit it. With, uh, this is something that uh, we have to be careful because we are interested in reconstruction. Okay? The second element, very, very important. Basically, we have produced multiple copies of the input spectrum. So, in fact, an infinite, infinite number of copies. So, I'll just write it as multiple copies of input spectrum. Through the sampling process, this is inevitable. This is uh, uh, of the input signal spectrum, or I'll just write it as input spectrum. And these input spectral copies are separated by multiples of the sampling frequency. So that is multiples of the sampling frequency. And all of these are very important in our uh, uh, study because uh, we are going to be talking about multiple sampling rates, but at the same time, the ability to reconstruct. So therefore, um, uh, multiples of, of the sampling, uh, sampling frequency. So uh, one interesting uh, observation, which we can draw from this, uh, from this uh, diagram. So observation. Now what should be the condition that the images don't overlap? What should be the condition that, uh, so basically look at this portion of the spectrum. Omega S minus omega B is the lower uh, uh, edge or the trailing edge and the leading edge is omega B. If this is greater than, uh, let's, make, let's keep it strictly greater than just for, uh, is greater than omega B, then there is no overlap. Am I right? And each of those, now you may say, why not, uh, why not you take it for any other of those gaps? You can take it for any gap. Eventually, you will find that the condition that it boils down to is that sigma s should be greater than 2 times omega b, right? And this is nothing but the Nyquist criterion. So the Nyquist criterion actually uh, uh, can be viewed uh, just from the sampling process, it becomes uh, uh, very evident. Now, you may say, why not uh, greater than or equal to? Okay, uh, if, you, if you say that it has to be uh, equal to, okay, let me just uh, give you the answer for that as well. That's what actually Nyquist criterion says. Anyone knows why in, in most of the practical uh, DSP uh, cases, we, we, do, we just say, okay, over-satisfy the Nyquist criterion. Don't, don't stay exactly at Nyquist. Okay, one at a time. Okay, uh, uh, th that, that is one. You have to be very careful about what is the value of the uh, spectrum at that uh, omega b. Okay, any other answer? The filter design. Okay, that, that's a very, very important element. Uh, because now, even from this uh, particular discussion, we can move into the next uh, uh, aspect of our uh, what we wanted to cover is the reconstruction process. So the sampling process has created the following. Sampling process has created these, the, uh, these images. Now let us say that we have uh, completed whatever uh, task we wanted to do and now we want to reconstruct the signal. So this is the sample signal. This is Xs of j omega. Now, the reconstruction process basically requires you to get rid of these images. So the reconstruction filter is actually a low-pass filter which removes all the unwanted images, keeps only the central image. Now, uh, the uh, aspect that was mentioned is that if you had exactly Nyquist criterion, 
then what you will need is a filter which is a ideal filter. Okay, ideal filter, a brick wall filter. Okay, and in neither in digital nor in analog are these realizable filters. So, uh, and of course, if it was not zero at this point, okay, uh, that was another point that was mentioned. Okay, uh, if it was not uh, if it was not zero, then it adds another uh, dimension dimension to the to the problem, because if you had a situation where you had something like this, uh, then it's it's even more tricky when you want to do the reconstruction process because uh, you want to make sure that your reconstruction filter does not remove any of the information of the signal. Now, uh, when th when this is a scenario and your filter is also uh, uh, in this in the same in the, in this drawn in this fashion, okay, what is the uh, frequency response of the filter at the bandage? It's supposed to be. Zero because it's a cutoff filter, right? It has to cut off. So uh, basically, uh, you 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 create some uh, issues about the reconstruction at the bandage. So uh, for one reason or the other, uh, you you would want to be uh, careful with the Nyquist criterion. So uh, so I would say that you know by and large, it's safer for us to over satisfy the Nyquist criterion, satisfy it in a uh, uh, in a manner that it is um, easy for us to uh, easy for us to work with. Okay, uh, let's let's take a uh, couple of uh, examples which uh, uh, I believe are uh, uh, helpful and instructive, and uh, we, we will then uh, look at some uh, interesting applications as well. So, uh, everyone comfortable with the uh, with the statement about the the reconstruction process? Okay, everyone is, is comfortable with that. Okay. And uh, also with the uh, statement about the the requirement of the uh, of the continuous time filter. 